Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome everyone uh, for this lecture on Aurobindo Ghosh and through Aurobindo we will try to understand his ideas on self and also his views on community and religion. In this lecture we are going to discuss Aurobindo's thought and uh, situating him in his larger historical political context and also the transformation or evolution in his life as well as in his thinking. So, uh, we will discuss that and finally, we will um, engage seriously with one of the key themes in Aurobindo Ghosh and his uh, political thought that is idea of self we are going to discuss and I would also like to um, summarize whatever we have done uh, so far in this course. So, uh, Aurobindo Ghosh is the third thinker and we have done Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Rabindranath Tagore. So, I will uh, request you all to uh, watch that video and uh, uh, send, send us your comments, suggestions, feedbacks and queries and we will try to respond to those as soon as possible or most certainly within 24 hours. So, I uh, invite you all to send your comments, feedbacks and suggestions on the lectures we have done so far. So, today we are going to discuss Aurobindo Ghosh and Aurobindo Ghosh in a way share some of the uh, thought or idioms or uh, vocabulary with the thinkers we have done and they also share some of the uh, uh, ideas about uh, how to transform society, how to imagine or uh, uh, envision a new uh, individual, a new self and what is the role of that self in his or her community and also in the larger community of the humanity as such. So, um, uh, all these thinkers do share such, uh, uh, such, such ideals, but Aurobindo Ghosh is uniquely positioned in these uh, uh, among these thinkers. Uh, he was someone who was uh, in initial years completely cut off from his land uh, that is uh, his native Bengal, uh, the language Bengali and uh, he remained aloof or kept aloof from whatever political or social happenings was uh, happening in his uh, native land in Bengal and also in India. So, he, he was uh, 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 educated. Uh, and remain uh, remained cut off from the happenings uh, uh, that was going on or unfolding in India. Uh, uh, so, intellectually or uh, in initial years he remained somewhat aloof and cut off from the um, native, uh, native land. When he came back then he began to seriously engage with uh, his uh, native language Bengali. In fact, he started from the beginning from the scratch and uh, dwelt deeper and deeper into Indian intellectual tradition, Vedas, Upanishad and many, uh, many other, uh, other texts and he translated a lot of, uh, lot of them. He uh, engaged very actively in the radical politics of uh, his time for a brief period and then completely retired from the politics and uh, uh, get involved in uh, in more uh, yogic discipline or intellectual uh, engagement in terms of writing and all. <coughs> so, Aurobindo Ghosh uh, remains somewhat a mystic figure and uh, yet very significant in terms of uh, his contribution in different, uh, different, um, uh, different areas including active politics and also some of the contemplative philosophical, uh, philosophical exercise. 
So, uh, we are going to discuss Arvindu Ghosh in that sense and there is some challenges while doing it, but also there are some uh, significance of engaging with his thought and ideals. So, what we find is Arvindu Ghosh, who is regarded as one of the prominent philosopher of 20th century India, he combined both political and spiritual dimensions of human life in his political thought. Now, this remains somewhat deeply intertwined in his thought and action, where he did not separate politics from spirituality and spirituality from politics. For him, this human life or human condition is in a process of evolution. And there, uh, there this uh, uh, shift or not really the shift evolution from a political to the spiritual realization is something in a, con, um, in a continuum, not a kind of break or kind of two uh, separate, uh, uh, separate dimension. So, in his all political thought, the combination of political and spiritual dimension of human life is very central. And um, um, as we have just said that he is regarded as the mo one of the prominent um, philosophers of 20th century India. And he is also known as a revolutionary, a spiritual leader, poet, philosopher and socio-political thinker. So, his interest is quite varied in terms of his engagement, his personal involvement with the social political upheaval of his time, uh, his sensi uh, sensitivity towards the larger challenges before the humanity as a poet, as a philosopher or uh, place of India in the larger, uh, larger world, his uh, uh, motherhood or the nation, the way he defined. He was very radical in his approach to politics and uh, he was put in jail because of his involvement in the revolutionary activities in, uh, in Bengal for a year. And then he transformed himself and in his own words, uh, realized the spiritual need of uh, uh, realization of true self or true, uh, true being which he called Adis and after realizing that he, uh, re uh, he retired from the politics and became a, a spiritual leader. Arvindu Ghosh combined all these different strands of activities and thought in his own, uh, uh, own life, in his own personality and that makes him more uh, complex, somewhat mysterious and uniquely positioned among the modern Indian political thinkers. Uh, the challenge for then us to examine and understand um, Arvindu Ghosh and his thought is for a very long time, his personality and contribution is not examined in its totality, which often led to reducing him merely as a religious figure or a mystic figure or a spiritual leader, uh, not having prag uh, practical, pragmatic application in resolving day to day political or other uh, challenges. The tendency of secularist, so called secularist uh, who wanted to uh, separate their ideas, their thought from anything that is uh, closer to religion or something which is embedded in religion. So, uh, the tendency of the secularist to distance themselves from him as well as the selective appropriation of Aurobindo by the right wingers, so called right wingers uh, in India are equally accountable for somewhat under exploration of Sri Aurobindo's thought and ideals in their totality. So, this uh, uh, uniqueness in his life and in his uh, uh, thought and uh, ideals. Uh, those who call themselves secularists tend to distance themselves from the so called religious thought of um, Arvindu reducing him merely as a religious a spiritual guru. And on the other hand, you have many right wing uh, trying to selectively appropriate Arvindu, certainly his idea of nation as a mother uh, or his religious definition of, uh, uh, of um, nationalism. So, one of the thinker like uh, Karan Singh, he uh, considered him as a prophet of Indian nationalism. So, um, there is this kind of um, um, challenges on the part of both secularist or the right wingers in their engagement with the Arvindo and his, uh, and his thought and that is perhaps the reason why there is a kind of uh, lacking 
in engaging with his thought and ideals in its totality, not selectively or not by reducing him to merely as a religious and, uh, and uh, a spiritual uh, uh, thinker. So, therefore, the need is to revisit Aurobindo and engage with his thought in all possible dimension, not merely through a spiritual or a religious lens, but uh, in all possible dimensions which we will discuss as we uh, as we move on in this course and now there is a new kind of reading or engagement with uh, with uh, arvindo and his thought um, uh, in contemporary times most recent is peter his edited work on arvindo goes so now uh, to understand the significance of arvindo it is appropriate perhaps to quote this bandhu chitranjan das when he was defending Arbindo goes in famous Alipur bomb conspiracy case and because of that he was put in the Alipur jail. So, uh, he was being tried with many other revolutionaries and this one who Chitranjan Das was defending Arbindo Ghosh and he appealed to the magistrate using these words which clearly signifies the uh, life and teachings of uh, Sri Arbindo uh, and he writes, I quote, my appeal to you is this that long after the controversy will be hustled in silence, this controversy surrounding Alipur bomb conspiracy, that long after the controversy will be hustled, hushed in silence, long after this turmoil and agitation will leave, will have ceased the turmoil in the political arena or agitation that was happening, when uh, long after such turmoil and agitation, after he is dead and gone, patriotism and the lover of humanity who is in the words of uh, this bandhu chitra poet of patriotism or the prophet of nationalism deeply uh, uh, deeply the unity with others and we will discuss when we will that long after his death and re -equal. not only in India, but across distant seas and lands. Thereafter, I say that the man in his position is not only standing before the bar of this court, but before the bar of high court of history. So, that certainly signifies the life and ideals of uh, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh and his intellectual transformation in terms of political happenings and positioning himself or his uh, response to such, such, hap uh, such happenings. Further on, his life and thought exemplify a living dialogue between what is called Eastern and what is Western philosophy. So, one professor Robert McDormand states that the complementary of politics and spirituality typifies Sri Aurobindo's ability to draw diverse streams into a rich and dynamic synthesis. So, he is also considered as a kind of syncretic thinker which accommodates, which unites, which, who synthesizes different strands of uh, thought within a culture or across the culture. As he combined politics and yoga on the one hand, he also combined Western and Indian values. So, in his own life, this combination of politics with yoga or spirituality on the one hand or values in different cultural or intellectual tradition on the other. So, he was more a kind of synthet, uh, syn, uh, synthesizing force in terms of uh, uh, articulating his ideas on many social political issues. And the ashram that Aurobindo established even today continue to practice most of these ideals through their day to day social and collective activity which transcends the limitation of a national boundary or a uh, nation state. So, uh, therefore, uh, as we have seen Aurobindo Ghosh remains somewhat a uh, mystic figure because of his, uh, uh, his engagement, his evolution in his activity personal life and also in his philosophy, where he tries to combine both the politics and spirituality to, together. And this combination is not just limited to Aurobindo. As we have seen before, when Raja Ram Mohan Roy, uh, Tagore 
and when we will discuss Bikanand or Mohandas Gandhi or even Iqbal, we will uh, we'll see this, uh, uh, this uh, occurrence of uh, relationship between religion on the other hand, politics on the uh, politics on the other, but the way um, Arvindu theorized his ideals of nation, nationalism, India's role in the world is deeply connected with his uh, understanding of this uh, relationship between the political and the spiritual. So, uh, now to briefly discuss him, uh, his early life, his personal life. His father Krishna Dhan Ghos was a doctor and he was deeply influenced by modern western uh, lifestyle or value system and wanted his children to be reared in this same, uh, same tradition. So, he wanted his, their sons should have European upbringing. So, along with his brothers, Arvindu was sent to an Irish nun school in Darjeeling and later to England with this clear instruction that Arvindu should be totally kept in distance from any Indian influence. So, for a very uh, long period as I was saying in the beginning, he was completely kept aloof from anything that is related to India or Indian matters. There in England, he graduated from King's College with a academic excellence and he also appeared in Indian Civil Service examination, which he could not qualify because he failed in the riding test. So, after getting the education and having achieved excellence, achieved success in his academic career, he came to India and work in Baroda states for 14 years. And this is the period when he seriously engaged with his own native mother tongue or uh, many Indian, um, Indian, uh, Indian text or treatises or ancient, uh, ancient Upanishad um, um, and other text and also engaged with the political activities, um, political activities in India. So, uh, this began with the publication of New Lamps for Old. So, this intellectual response to the necessities or requirements of India when he returned and joined the Baroda state. He wrote that theorist Thriffler, though I may be called, I again assert as our first and holiest duty, motivation and enlightenment of the proletariat. The proletariat is, as I have striven to show, the real key to the situation. Torpid he is and immobile. He is nothing of an actual force, but he is a very great force and whoever succeeds in understanding become by the very fact master of the future. Now, this is something he was writing before the Russian revolution, before Gandhi emerged on the scene, before Indian uh, struggle for freedom took the character of a mass movement, but he was the one who realized the force of the masses or the proletariat in social or political transformation. And he in fact somewhat foresee the emergence of a leader who can unite this force, mobilize this force, which is at present it is immobile or aloof or uh, indifferent to the political situations and the political happenings or in other words, uh, this uh, historically speaking the Indian National Congress. Uh, dominated by the moderates, believing in the constitutional method for social political reforms, could not really uh, uh, energize uh, uh, this uh, uh, proletariat and which is the basis for true social political transformation. And then we move on to his active political life, which is for a very brief period from 1905 to 1910, he actively engaged in the uh, politics and was connected or familiar with the revolutionaries activities in uh, Bengal. So, what you find is um, uh, Arvindo Ghosh is not just giving uh, the intellectual response to the situations and um, unfolding of events in the political life of India, but also himself was involved um, in many, uh, many activities. And uh, in this very brief period, he emerged as a, uh, as a uh, prominent leader of Indian national movement and he was invited not just by many uh, natives uh, in his uh, uh, native province of Bengal, but also in Maharashtra or in Punjab or in other, other, other parts. So, he, he became a force to reckon with, even the Britishers feared his uh, active involvement in the 
political activities. So, within Indian National Congress, he was the very influential members of the ex extremist section. So, as you're saying that during the time he was engaging with the uh, with the politics, uh, Congress was by and large divided into two uh, two groups: extremist and the moderate. Uh, in the extremist, uh, you uh, have um, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, uh, C. R. Das, along with Arvind Ghosh, and um, um, uh, the moderate faction of uh, Congress was represented by um, uh, Firoz Shah Mehta, uh, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, among many others. So, uh, uh, Arbindo joined the um, extremist groups within the Congress. He actively participated in the national movement of India for around five years, and in combination with Chandra Pal and Bal Gangadhar Tilak, he vehemently protested against the partition of Bengal and also criticized the moderates and their methods within the Congress. So, his immediate involvement was during the Swadeshi movement and as a response to the partition of Bengal by the um, British, um, British rule. And he saw um, uh, the nation uh, as a uh, mother and uh, therefore, his engagement with the struggle for freedom, political freedom of uh, the motherland is a more kind of religious duty. And therefore, he uh, uh, conceptualized individual sacrifice for the uh, 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 creation or for the uh, attainment of freedom for the uh, for the motherland. And uh, therefore, he also uh, was very critical of the methods that was being uh, being um, uh, applied by the mod moderates. And uh, he also gradually realized the servile or um, uh, dishonesty on the parts of uh, the British uh, British rule, and he uh, he realized that it cannot be it cannot be uh, trusted to allow uh, the Indians to acquire the capability to represent themselves. In other words, he uh, seriously doubted not just the uh, methods of the moderates, but also the intention of the uh, Britishers, and therefore became a um, um, became an enemy or the greatest enemy for the uh, uh, for uh, for the uh, for the British and many uh, vice uh, certainly one viceroy um, recommended that Arvindo Ghosh is the force to reckon with for the British Empire in India and he acquires immediately the position of prominent that is reflected in 1907 when Congress was uh, there was a clear um, uh, divide between uh, extremists and the moderates, for, and for the next ten years, such divides uh, divide divide was there. So, uh, Arvind Ghosh was the uh, uh, chairman of the informal meeting of the uh, of the extremist groups in the 1907 Surat Congress. So, uh, that's his deep engagement or or involvement with the. Um, uh, with the national politics. At this point, it is also perhaps uh, um, appropriate to understand the method he was uh, he was uh, um, uh, contemplating for the political movement in India. So, like Gandhi, he was talking about the passive resistance as the method for uh, political uh, um, political reforms or political movements in India. But what should be the uh, method of such passive resistance? Should be it be always unconditionally non-violent as Gandhi was arguing or there should be a scope of violence. Uh, Arvind Ghaus has a very, um, very uh, innovative or unique response to such, uh, uh, such question where he believes that the nature of response will depend on the nature of repression from the oppressors. So, if there is a time for arguing, articulating, mobilizing peacefully within the limits of the law or constitution, then one should have non-violent um, uh, uh, passive uh, resistance. But if oppressor, uh, oppressor is too, um, too brute, then the violence or use of violence on the part of resistor cannot be completely ignored or should not be criticized. So, the nature of response or the use of violence or non-violence depend on the condition and uh, Arvindu Ghosh was very 
uh, unique and uh, different from Gandhian position on the passive resistance. So, in this period what we also find is he continuously wrote in Bande Matram, a journal which was edited by Pin Chandra Pal and he himself started another journal called Karma Yogin, which remained a powerful political commentary of that time. So, many uh, leaders certainly like Jawaharlal Nehru, who writes in the foreword to Karan Singh book on uh, Arvind Ghosh and his thought that he himself was, uh, when he was in England uh, during that time, he used to uh, read the uh, commentaries or essay written by Arvind Ghosh in Bande Matram to understand many of the uh, political situation in India. As I was saying that uh, uh, in Arvind Ghosh, his uh, treatment of native land or country as motherland, nation as mother and believing and worshipping it as divine remains central to his political philosophy. For him, the struggle for nation and nationhood is not just kind of objective, instrumental approach to attain freedom, but for him it is a more kind of religious, spiritual activity to connect or to understand or realize uh, the nation as a mother and through that uh, the attainment of, uh, uh, of a, spiritual, uh, a, a spiritual life or uh, a spiritual meaning of self and the other. So, uh, his uh, engagement with Swadeshi or the political activities of that time was guided by this, uh, this um, uh, philosophy of um, understanding nation as a mother and believing and worshipping it as a divine. Uh, so, he has a very religious or a spiritual uh, understanding of nation or national, uh, national freedom. When he was convicted of the Alipur bomb case, he was jailed for one year, after which he, was, he put an end to his political career and through the later part of his life limited his activities to a spiritual domain. Perhaps this, is, this was also the time in the words of uh, Arvindo, he uh, realized his uh, objective or the goal of life that is in a spiritual domain and he, um, he retired from the active politics after that, uh, uh, that incarnation and uh, uh, take, um, um, uh, take um, um, uh, went to, uh, uh, went to um, French occupied Pondicherry at that time called Chandranagar, uh, close to Madras and from then on, from 1910 to 1950s involved himself in the uh, spiritual activity. After this retirement, he founded one ashram in Pondicherry, which formally came into being in 1926, uh, where he continued to stay till his, uh, till the end of his life in 1950s and mainly he was engaged in writing and meditation. He considers the mystic experience of those days in Alipur jail as the factor leading to this transformation in his political spiritual life. And this was a transition from the nationalist anti-colonial revolutionary Arvindo Ghosh to the international and cosmopolitan Sri Arvindo. That is the kind of evolutionary understanding of self and the other or society that was there in uh, Arvindo's thought deeply embedded in his political philosophy is also uh, exemplified in his own personal life where he began as someone completely aloof from the Indian happenings who deeply engaged with the activities uh, in the political arena uh, 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 was familiar with the rad uh, radical or the revolutionary groups in Bengal and then gradually transformed himself uh, as a complete uh, a spiritual uh, uh, person. And this transformation of Arvindo Ghosh to Sri Arvindo also establish or establishes focus on the international and the cosmopolitan ideals all these things. So, what we find in Arvindo Ghosh uh, and his major idea is the synthesis of Eastern and Western values while taking the western from in philosophy, he kept Indian its substance. So, he was someone accommodative uh, of different cultures, different intellectual tradition and uh, bringing them together, combining them together to, uh, uh, to give his own unique syn uh, uh, synthetic kind of um, uh, philosophy and uh, ideas. 
and uh, he believed in the objectification of a spirit that is the expression of the universal in the individual life and this relationship between individual or the uh, social or the universal is something which is deeply embedded or forms the basis of Aurobindo's uh, political and uh, spiritual ideas. In his opinion, it is the spirit alone that saves and only by becoming great and free in heart can we become politically great and free. So, for him the political freedom or Swaraj is not just uh, to achieve political independence merely, but until and unless we also realize or internalize this freedom or greatness in heart in the spirit that we are part of the whole, we are part of the universal, we are part of the social, we cannot be politically free or great. So, for him political freedom is some something which enables the individual to realize this um, uh, freedom and greatness in his or her heart and only then uh, a nation can become politically great and free. Um, and in his thought, he was deeply influenced by European thinkers like Karl Lamprecht uh, and August Comte and he borrowed the idea of distinct psychological stages that society passes through from Lamprecht, which is symbolic, conventional, individualistic and subjective. We will come to this when we will discuss his views on self. As I have discussed that he regarded the path of passive resistance as appropriate in India's struggle for independence, but what should be the method of such passive resistance depend on the oppressors, the method that oppressors applies to tackle the resistance. And uh, he was a passionate, more emotional, psychological supporter of Indian nationalism and therefore, Karan Singh rightly pointed out and many others including as we have seen uh, this Bandhu Chitranjan Das, prophet of Indian nationalism. And for him, nationalism was not merely a political program. Unlike many others, many of his contemporaries, the uh, nation or nationalism for him was not a merely a political program program, but it is some way religion which is gifted by God and all Indians should sacrifice for the attainment of such a spiritual or religious, a religious idea of nation as motherhood, the way he defined it. And there he differs a lot from many pragmatic thinkers of his time. And uh, he also had a decolonized vision of international religion and many uh, argue like Sartre and many others the uh, significance of Arvindo to understand the global uh, cooperation, global relationship between and among the nation states also. And this uh, decolonized vision of international relation is inclusive of the other and recognize the possibility of alternative visions of a world state. And that is some uh, something which remains under explored in Arvindo Ghosh, uh, Arvindo Ghosh and uh, his political thought as I was saying in the beginning because there is a serious reservation on the part of secularist to reduce him merely as a religious or a spiritual thinker and on the part of right wingers to selectively appropriate him and uh, understand him merely as a prophet of nationalism. But in Arvindo's thought, there is the possibility of understanding or decolonizing the vision of international relation as well as many thinkers have argued. So, uh, what we also find is that he was critical of democracy in both its bourgeoisie and socialist form. So, there was the growing assertion of bourgeoisie form of liberal democracy on the other hand or socialist form of democracy on the other hand. And uh, Arvindo was critical of both these forms and what he proposed was a huge confederation of the people. He believed in this idea of confederation rather than a kind of organized instrumental of a system of governance. So, he considered a spiritual religion of humanity as the hope of the future. He thought that the spiritual unity will lead to psychological unity and his primary concern was the spiritual transformation of the people rather than material, political or economic transformation merely. And to attain that spiritual unity, he was arguing for a loose confederation of people rather than a well organized form of governance, be it liberal or a socialist form of democracy. His converse was too broad to reduce it merely as a religious or a spiritual thinker. So, apart from being a radical activist in his early life and a spiritual in the rest of it, Arvindo was a prolific writer and some of his remarkable works are 
the ideal of human unity, which remains his lifelong ideals, and he continued to practice such ideals in his ashram in uh, Pondicherry, and uh, that ashram in Auroville he continued to practice mean most of such ideals. So, his focus was on the ideal of humanity, the life divine, Savitri, the synthesis of yoga, essays on the Gita, the integral yoga, the mind of light. So, Arvindo remained deeply engaged intellectually with many, many issues uh, uh, through his writings besides his spiritual urge or spiritual uh, practice or discipline in the most part of his life, but also um, as a revolutionary radical activist in early life. And he also published a journal which he titles Arya from 1914 to 1921. Now, to discuss his uh, ideas on self, it is perhaps uh, uh, appropriate to begin with his understanding of human being uh, or his or her ego and what is the role of such ego and how one can transcend such ego from this quotation which he, uh, which he wrote in True and False Subjectivism from the Human Cycle. For Arvindo, the ego is not the self, there is one self of all and the soul is a portion of that universal divinity. The fulfillment of the individual is not the utmost development of his egoistic intellect, vital force, physical well-being and the utmost satisfaction of his mental, emotional, physical cravings, but the flowering of the divine in him to its utmost capacity of wisdom, power, love and universality uh, and through this flowering, his utmost realization of all the possible beauty and delight of existence. So, for Arvindo Ghosh, most certainly and we will see how he differs from liberal and the utilitarian conception of self and the purpose in life. The ego that is there in this all being is not the self. For him, there is only one self which is there in all and uh, the soul in the self is the portion of that universal divinity which he also called Virat Purush or supreme being. Now, the fulfillment of the individual life is not the utmost development of his egoistic intellect then or vital force or physical well-being or the utmost satisfaction of his mental, emotional, physical cravings, but the flowering of divine in him, this realization that his is part of something bigger which is in all uh, all self that realization um, uh, leads to uh, utmost wisdom power love and universality and through this flowering one realizes all that possible beauty and delight of existence so this understanding in arvindo ghosh is more evolutionary rather than aesthetic rather than rigid or given so, individual as uh, his or her life unfolds, one uh, realizes this uh, purpose of life which is not about you know uh, fulfillment of the individual uh, uh, or his egoistic intellect or his personal individual biological needs, but the realization of this divine in him and through that then one realizes the possible beauty and delight of human existence and that is how he defines the individual and his self. So, this is uh, then comes the connection between individual and the eternal self. Eternal self is something which is bigger, which is always there, which is omnipresent uh, in everyone. So, unlike Christian theology, duality natural and the supernatural is not perceived in Indian philosophy, which is one way of differentiating between Indian philosophy or Indian philosophy of nature or self on the one hand and the Christian or Western philosophy on the other. So, this duality of natural or supernatural is not perceived in Indian philosophy and it views the natural and supernatural as the manifestation of the same energy. So, there is no kind of duality between nature or the supernatural. So, Arvindo II making the connection between the individual and the universal argues that the eternal is the self of all other selves. So, what is eternal, what is universal is something which is there in everyone, in all selves and it is the origin of all energy and support in nature. So, that is the vital force, this eternal self is always there and it 
to is manifested manifested in individual self and this manifestation is not just in one self or a group of self but in all self in all human being and the task then for the human being is to realize that existence of divine in him and that is something connected with the tagore ideals of um, uh, self as we have discussed in previous lectures so for him the eternal or the supreme self is the supreme purusha or the virat purush and individual selves are the manifestation of uh, that virat purush or the supreme self now what is true self then in the individual arvindo talks about two individual self and dipti selves these dipti selves are the physical self the vital self the mental self the supramental self and the blissful selves so these are the different layers or different aspects of individual self uh, like physical vital mental or uh, supramental and the final is the bliss blissful self for him the true self is not the body the vital ego or the rational mind the spiritual individual resembles the true self so for him the true self is not the ego of the individual or his vital ego or uh, rational mind but uh, the uh, spiritual individual who is the spiritual individual one who realizes the existence of divine in him or existence of virat purush or supreme being in him resembles the true self to understand this we can think about his evolutionary understanding of human collective self from symbolic to conventional to individualist and then finally subject so these are different stages of uh, realization of collective human self so first stage he uh, calls symbolic stage is the one in which all the institutions and things become for man a symbolic expression of the divine that's the very primitive uh, beginning of um, understanding the divine which is more in terms of attributing some uh, faculty to uh, some institution some uh, form and using it as a uh, symbolic expression of the divine so that's the symbolic stage of um, uh, collective self that is followed by the conventional stage which is more rigid and formalized so in all religion or especially organized religion this stage is more towards fixing the meaning fix or uh, or or fixing or finality defines the conventional stage which is that every religion in its fundamentalist kind of interpretation claims monopoly over absolute truth and what it claims is considered as final so that's the conventional stage of collective selves when there is a kind of rigid and formalized structure of divine uh, self or divine understanding now this kind of understanding is followed by the resistance of reason and individual freedom which he calls the individualist is so the resistance to this fixed rigid formalized uh, religion through reason or individual freedom that's the beginning of enlightenment or modern liberal um, uh, understanding of self or the individual is that the reason and the individual is the true guide to understand the self and the other and that is the hallmark of individualist uh, individualist stage now um, arvindo ghosh is arguing for realization of the subjective age and this subjective age is characterized by the emphasis on the spiritual freedom of individual not merely the use of reasonal rational faculty or the autonomy of the individual but understanding the spiritual freedom and this spiritual freedom again is the unity of self with the other one human being with the rest of the human beings and understanding that in all human beings there is the manifestation of same divine same supreme being which he also called virat purush and that is how he wanted to organize a confederacy of people and not really a kind of organized instrumental relations in or among the nation states so for him this subjective is or this spiritual freedom of individuals can be attained once individual internalize this belief and this belief is about the existence of same force of divine or the virat purush in him and then when that individual after internalizing that belief also believe that the supreme being 
is one and all expressed in the individual and in the collectivity and only by admitting and realizing our unity with others can we fulfill our true self being. So, for him the realization of true self being requires or prerequisites this belief in the existence of supreme being which is one and all and expressed in the individual and in the collectivity and only by admitting and realizing our unity with others. So, the existence of individual human being is not in isolation, not an autonomous self defining kind of subject, but in realizing this relationship or the intimate relationship with the others because of this similar manifestation of divine in others also, only then um, uh, he believes we can fulfill our true self being or realize or true self being. So, what we find in Aurobindo uh, and his ideas on uh, self that he is very critical of western liberal conception of man as a rational and autonomous being or merely as a rational and autonomous being or self defining subject. He was also critical of utilitarian view of the greatest happiness of the greatest number. That kind of uh, utilitarian understanding of human being or human life was deeply problematic for, uh, for Aurobindo because in his uh, views such approach not only limits the rationalism, the meaning of rationality or rationalism for the individual, but also obstruct the spiritual and the political evolution of individual. That is something is the constant evolutionary stages in human or collective social life that Arvindo focuses. So, this understanding of individual or man as merely as a rational and autonomous being or also the philosophy of greatest good of the greatest number for uh, Arvindu actually obstruct this realization of a spiritual and political evolution in man. So, for him man is not just a material or expression of material or a soul, but an spiritual evolutionary being and this man is also a necessary force of a spirit for its evolutionary manifestation or progressive manifestation in the physical world. The point he is trying to make here is that the man or individual and as we have discussed with in, um, in Tagore, the transcendence, immanent and the transcendence, something similar is here and it is perhaps more clear. That is that uh, understanding of man is not merely as a manifestation of matter or a soul, but a spiritual evolutionary being and this individual as an in spiritual being is a necessary force of a spirit and this spirit is something which is universal, something which is universal, uh, something which is omni uh, present and something which is in all of us. Now, this spirit, this universal uh, spirit or universal uh, being manifest itself or manifest its progressive and evolutionary uh, um, stages in the physical world, in our material world through this man which is a spiritual human being. So, there is a kind of complementarity between the universal spirit on the one hand and man on the other hand. So, man in a way, individual in a way represent uh, the universal spirit through his or her life and through uh, his activities and his life his uh, purpose is to uh, to expand such a realization and const, uh, construct a relationship which uh, is more based on love, harmony, cooperation and transcendent, uh, transcending all kind of limitations and narrowness. So, what we also find he interrelates the individual with the collective self or the society. Now, how he interrelates the individual with the other? as I was saying that in connection with the others, in realization with others, the existence of divine, the human being realizes the, uh, uh, the true meaning of his self and in a way represent the universal spirit in the physical world. So, through man uh, universal spirit manifests itself in the physical world. Now, this relationship between individual and the other or society it's based summarized by Deutsch when he writes that a spiritual and political liberation is to be found in a very specific kind of relationship between the individual and society. It is Aurobindo's insightful discussion on this relationship 
that makes his great contribution to the world political thought and becomes the basis for his solution to the perennial question of how political freedom can be realized within the context of a spiritual perfection. So uh, for him political freedom cannot be realized unless there is also a spiritual perfection, a spiritual, uh, a spiritual realization. So in this uh, relationship between man and society what we find in Aurobindo is this recognition that how political freedom or the condition which enables the individual realize his spiritual nature or his spiritual existence is something which can be attained collectively in a society and therefore political freedom is necessary. But political freedom is incomplete or uh, inadequate without the spiritual perfection and that is the basis for his idea of nation, nationalism or even the world relationship or the confederacy of people that he was arguing about. So, uh, that is what um, uh, is there in Aurobindo's political thought uh, and his ideas on man, his personal um, uh, engagement with the politics or the spiritual uh, search in the man hand. So, whatever we have discussed today, uh, you can look at some of these texts, the foundation of Indian political thought by V. R. Mehta and also Sri Aurobindo and the search of political and spiritual perfection by Kenneth Duge and Pentham from their book on political thought in modern India. This text remain the key text for our course. So, from this text there is one chapter by Kenneth Duge on Sri Aurobindo which you can look at. Also from Peter Hayes edited situating Sri Aurobindo and then from Aurobindo himself you can find his essays on the human cycle, the ideal of human unity, war and self-determination and certainly current Singh especially his uh, essay on Arbindo the revolutionary and also prophet of Indian nationalism you can look at. So, please go through the uh, readings, uh, watch the lectures and let us know what you think about the lecture and about your queries and comments. Thank you.